Hi everybody and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video we are going to be looking at a past exam question and you can of course use this particular video to practice for an upcoming test or an exam and if you want to pause the video now attempt the questions then do so because I'm going to walk you through how to answer these questions and how to get full marks because of course that is the object of this video to get your full marks and get your answers perfect. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed with your notifications turned on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday. And if you are in grade 12 or 11, you can currently get my study guide, which is available on my website, missangler.co.za. So let's jump straight into the question. This is definitely one of the more harder questions that I have selected before. And you'll notice that if you look at the mark allocation, they're not very high, but you have to have a very, very good understanding of meiosis and gametogenesis in order to answer this. And that's why it makes it a little more challenging because it's a crossover. And um, even though you don't have to write long explanations, you are going to have to do some working out. So let's have a look at the description of the diagram. Remember, we always want to break the diagram first down before we do the questions. It says diagram one and two below represent gametogenesis in human males and females in not in any particular sequence. Okay, that's very important to, to make a note of that. And then it says the diagrams are not drawn to scale. So before we go on any further, I suggest to you that you've got to work with what's on the picture first. You have got to annotate it. You've got to write things down. And so already I'm thinking to myself, which one of these is the male and which one is the female? So I'm going to start with diagram number one. Now, the thing that gives it away as to whether it's male or female is this very large cell that is produced over here versus these three smaller cells that are produced here. Because of that, I can automatically tell that this is a female because at the end of eugenesis or oogenesis, you will make one ovum and three polar bodies. Versus diagram two, you have four evenly sized cells. And so that's definitely letting me know that this is the male. I've also noticed that there is a number one, a number two, and a number three here. And we're gonna see what we're gonna do with that later on, what they want us to give. So let's go over to the questions now. It says, identify the specific type of gametogenesis in diagram one. And this is why you would have needed to identify that that was a female, because now the answer you need to give is, of course, eugenesis, right? Number two, explain your answer given in 221 by referring to the visible difference between diagram one and diagram two. Now, Please remember, when doing an explain question, you always provide a statement with a reason. Now, in giving our statement, we are going to say that in diagram one, there is only one ovum produced versus our reasoning for diagram two, knowing that that is male, is that we have four sperm cells. And so the statement could also be written out along the lines of something like, um, at the end of oogenesis, we produce only one ovum with three polar bodies. Whereas in diagram two, there are four evenly sized cells which represent sperm cells. Looking into our next question, it says, where in the human body does the type of gametogenesis shown in diagram two take place? Again, this is why it was so important in the beginning to determine which one was male and female. Because that is male, we actually have two answers. You could have said testes, but if you want to be like super specific, you could have also said the seminiferous tubules. I'm not going to write out the whole word, but it's a seminiferous tubule. I would have gone with testes because that's the more obvious and easier answer to give. In 2.2.4, it says, give the chromosome number of cells at one and then at two. Now, this is really important to go back to the question. The question at the beginning says that this is humans. So humans start off with having 46 chromosomes. When they undergo a meiosis, they will end up having 23. So that means at number one, how many chromosomes do we have? And then again, at number two, 
how many chromosomes are present. So if this is the original cell at the beginning, that means there are 46 here. After the first meiotic division, there should be 23. However, after the second meiotic division, there should still only be 23. Okay, because remember, in meiosis 1, we separate the pairs. In meiosis 2, we separate the chromatids. So you're not halving 23 again. What you're doing is you're just separating chromatids from one another. And so our answer for cells at 1 are going to be 23, and cells at 2 are also going to be 23. Don't be thrown off by a, an answer being repeated like this because they love to do that to make it a little bit more like tricky or difficult because you doubt yourself. Don't doubt yourself. You are correct. All right, 2.2.5. Name two processes that take place during meiosis one that lead to genetic variation in the four cells shown at diagram, uh, in diagram two or at three. So they want to know two processes that happen in meiosis one. Now, I can think of two off the top of my head, and you should be able to recall these very quickly. They are going to be crossing over, which remember is when the two homologous pairs touch one another and they exchange genes. And number two, I'm going to say here, random arrangement which, of course, is the random way in which maternal and paternal chromosomes line on the equator. You don't know, are you going to get the maternal one or are you going to get the paternal one? Okay, let's go on to our last question. Explain the implication for a human population size if three cells referred to in diagram one did not degenerate but remained as gametes. Now, this is a lovely extension question. And what I mean by that is there is a little bit of thinking on your part to get full marks for this. What they are saying is if females produced four ovums, right, instead of one ovum, what would the implication be? on the population numbers. Well, the implication, popu uh, implication on the population, remember it's an explained question, we've got to make a statement and then a reason. So a statement. Our statement is going to be four ovum are produced, right? Now if four ovum are produced, then there are more children born. Or you could say more offspring, or you could say more chances for fertilization to take place to have four children instead of one, which equals a larger population. And we've got to include that at the end of our answer because it is asking what is the implication on the human population size? You know, is the size going to get bigger or is it going to get smaller? Now, here is the official memo. You're more than welcome to go through it and just read some of the new answers uh, in this particular answer. And, of course, you can go down to here, question 2.2.6. Their answer is slightly different to the one I've given. But, again, remember that when we are marking exams and tests, teachers are very open to sort of interpreting the same answer being written in a different way. So I said there'd be four births. Four births is the same as saying multiple births, right? Or, like I said to you, increasing your chances of fertilization, which of course then increases the population. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and please make sure your notifications are turned on so you're notified the moment I post a new video and I will see you all again soon. Bye!